The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, we have been considering a scripture. It's the 10th chapter of Zechariah and verse 3. Very strange scripture where the Lord says that his anger was kindled against the shepherds and so he punished the goats. And that just seems like a very strange statement, but it directs our attention to a ceremony. In fact, it was the principal feast of the Jewish year called the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement was when the sins of Israel, rather than being judged, the Lord put judgment off for another year, and so the nation was sealed for another year. I want to consider the ceremony, the liturgy of the Day of Atonement in a very simple way because it's a very complicated liturgy. But on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, first of all, made an offering for himself and for his house. And as a Christian, I see this as Christ sacrificing himself for his house, which is the church, his body. The church is the pearl of great price, and it was for the pearl of great price that the merchant man sold everything that he had that he might buy the pearl of great price. Now, after the high priest had sacrificed for himself and his house, two goats, G-O-A-T-S, were presented at the door of the congregation. So this is where the, con the congregation now, uh, at the door of the congregation, the gates, goats are presented. Well, lots were cast for the goats. And one goat was chosen for the Lord. It was called the, the goat for Jehovah. And one was chosen to be what in the English Bible is called the scapegoat. Now, the Lord's goat was sacrificed while the sins of the nation were then confessed on the head of the second goat, and the scripture said a fit man or a suitable man, usually a priest, led the goat away into the wilderness. They have confessed the sins of the nation on the head of the goat, and the fit man leads the goat away into the wilderness, into a land that is not inhabited. Well, to say that this is unlike any other religious ceremony of any kind that I know about is an understatement. I mean, this is a strange and different kind of ceremony. Now, the interesting thing is, we read about this in the 16th chapter of the book of Leviticus, verses 8 and 10 and 26. So you read one goat as a goat for Jehovah, one is the scapegoat. But the interesting thing is the word that is rendered scapegoat by the English translators is actually the word Azazel. Now that's hidden by our English translation, but the word is actually Azazel, A-Z-A-Z-E-L. And hence the translation of Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 8 should read this way, should read like this. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. You might say, well, what in the world does that mean? Well, Strong's Concordance, if you look it up, look up the meaning of the Hebrew called the word, the word Azazel comes from two words, A-Z-E, to use English lettering, which means a she-goat, or means to be strong, and L, meaning God. Now, the Bible dictionary says that this word Azazel only occurs here in this 16th chapter of Leviticus. And not surprisingly, most Bible commentators find this second goat very difficult to identify and so to boil all their ideas down into one simple statement, they see three possible standalone 
explanations. One is that the word Azazel means scapegoat and is to be explained as that which goes away. This is where we get the word scapegoat in the English language and the meaning of the word scapegoat. The kids today would say fall guy, the fall guy, the one that takes the fall, the one that takes the hit, the one that is to blame. So the scapegoat is the one that takes the hit, it takes the blame. Then secondly, scholars think that Azazel may mean a desolate region. And then thirdly, they think it is the name possibly of a demon that haunts that region and is to be explained as derived from Azaz meaning to be strong and El, which means God. And again, the Bible dictionary says that most scholars prefer this third understanding since the name appears uh, in parallel to the name of God. And incidentally, as a fallen angel, Azazel is mentioned in the apocryphal book of Enoch 6 and 6 and onwards. Well, even if all that is true, it isn't very satisfactory, and it leaves us in the dark. Now, Bullinger, the great Bible scholar, says that this Azazel looks like a personality. And he goes further to say that Azazel is probably the personification of all that is great and terrible. But where does that get us? I don't see that that explanation gets us anywhere at all. And I don't see this interpretation as following the biblical principle, principle of translating scripture or understanding scripture in the light of scripture. The word of God says that in thy light we shall see light. And the word of God also assures us that there is no scripture of any single interpretation. So even if we can't see this word Azazel elsewhere in the Bible, and even if we think this isn't mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, the principles that the Lord has given us for understanding scripture says we just need to look harder. That somewhere in the Bible there is going to be something that helps us understand what all of this is about. So I reject the idea that this refers to a demon, and I reject the ideas that have been presented. Sixty years ago, world missionary evangelism began when John E. Douglas Sr. accepted the challenge of caring for six orphan children in India. From this act of love sprang a work that has grown to include children's homes, schools, leper clinics, vocational and agricultural education, disaster relief, feeding programs, drilling water wells, and building churches. And at the heart of all of WME's work has been living out the Great Commission to take the news of salvation through Jesus to everyone we meet. During these six decades, World Missionary Evangelism's work has grown from the initial effort to save six children in India to establishing mission projects across the globe. To celebrate 60 years of Christian outreach, World Missionary Evangelism has developed our 60 for 60 program. The 60 for 60 campaign is a way for you to help us commemorate six decades of work and fund programs for the future. By giving $60 a month to our 60 for 60 campaign, you can help us expand our outreach. To begin your support of the 60 for 60 campaign today, call toll free at 1-800-501 2851. That's 1-800-501-2851. And if you would prefer to mail in your gift, send it to WME, Post Office Box 660800. That's 660800, Dallas, Texas 75266. what does the word Azazel mean? When the Lord said, I was angry at the shepherds, my anger was kindled at the shepherds, and I punished the goats, 
and that directed our attention to a ceremony, a feast called the Day of Atonement, when two goats were presented, and one goat was the goat for Jehovah, and one goat was the goat for Azazel. And we said, what does that mean? And scholars have done a lot of speculation, but very few of them have noted that the explanation can be found two chapters earlier in the book of Leviticus. That's very, very interesting. So they're wondering, what in the world does the word Azazel mean? And if they would look at two chapters early in the book of Leviticus, they would find the answer. And it is presented in another ceremony in the liturgy for the cleaning or cleansing of leprosy in a person or for cleansing a house which the owner thinks may have been infected or exposed to leprosy. And this chapter, chapter 14 of Leviticus, is extremely interesting because it's a long, long chapter. The ceremony is basically very simple, but it's such a long chapter. And the reason is, is that this ceremony is structured for the more affluent, the more financial people that can pay for a, um, you know, a bigger offering, better offering. Uh, it's structured for the less financial, less affluent, and it's also structured for the cleansing of a physical house that somebody owns. If somebody thinks that their house may have been contaminated uh, and needs to be cleansed, there's a potential for leprosy there, then this ceremony also will address the house in which they live, which is significant. Now, basically, this ceremony for the cleansing of lepers involves two birds. And these two birds are alive and clean. Now, some birds under Old Testament law are not clean. And an example would be a vulture. And we can understand that. The vulture is not a clean bird. We might think of it as a turkey as being a clean bird. So you can understand it from that point of view. Well, the two birds are alive and they're clean. And then one bird is killed in an earthen vessel. So you have an earthen vessel and the bird is killed in the vessel over running water. Now, you look at some of these ceremonies in the Old Testament, and if you're a Gentile, you really think these are strange people. I've got some strange customs but we'll get to an understanding of it. Now, when the priest does this, he also takes some cedar wood, some hyssop, and some scarlet. Now, hyssop is a branch, and it's used for sprinkling. And if you go to the mainline churches, the Catholic church, or say the Anglican church, any mainline church, they have a thing called an aspirator, and um, it's kind of fun to watch the priest go down the aisle sprinkling water to the left hand and the right, especially if you're close to him when he starts sprinkling. And I think some of these priests enjoy uh, soaking down the congregation. But at any rate, one bird is killed in an earthen vessel over running water, and the other bird is taken along with some cedar, some hyssop, and scarlet, and the second bird is dipped in the blood of the first bird that was killed over running water. And then, after the bird has been dipped in the blood, the priest takes the hyssop and he dips it in the blood and he sprinkles it on the leper. And then he lets the live bird go free. Well, that's enough to make you sit and think. In the Old Testament, leprosy is a type of sin. It's a symbol of sin. God used leprosy, an Old Testament disease. Well, it's really a modern disease too, but it was very prevalent in Old Testament times in history BC. Leprosy is a type of sin. And Schofield makes the comment that the two birds represent two aspects of salvation. The thought of being delivered for our offenses in the bird that is killed, and the thought of being raised for our justification 
in the case of the burn that is almost killed, so to speak, by being dipped in the blood of the first bird and then set free. And I really think, strangely enough, this is the first instant, or first instance, I should say, of the concept of the expression washed in the blood. Now, when I was a young man going to church, it was very common to ask people, are you washed in the blood? Of course, if you ask that to a sinner who knows nothing about Christianity, he really thinks that maybe you have a problem. We used to sing about, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Have you been to Jesus for the healing stream? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? So I think that this is probably the first instance in the Scripture of this phrase, wash in the blood. Now, Schofield further comments that the earthen vessel in which the first bird is killed speaks of the humanity of Christ, the humanity of Christ. God came incarnate in human form, and so killing the first bird in the earthen vessel speaks of the humanity of Christ. And I think that the running water or living water when we talk about living water, we're talking about running water. Uh, I think that running water or living water speaks of the Word of God and of Christ seen prophetically in the Word of God. Well, with reference to the two goats, Schofield says that the slain goat, Jehovah's Lot, is that aspect of Christ's death that satisfies and vindicates the holiness and righteousness and grace of God and the second or living goat typifies that aspect of Christ's work that puts away our sins from before God. And in these opinions, I think Schofield is absolutely correct. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you, who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles. Simply call us at considering a very strange verse in the 10th chapter of the prophet Zechariah, and it's verse 3, and I'm going to read it. It's a very short verse, but let me read the verse, and here's what it says. It says, My anger, now this is the Lord speaking, My anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and made them as his goodly horse in battle. Now, I'll read that again. 
My anger, this is God speaking, was kindled against the shepherds and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts, and that's the, that's the battle name of God, that's the warrior name of God. This is the God of battle, the, the Lord of hosts, sometimes translated as the God of battles. The Lord of hosts hath done deal, not will, hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and made them as his goodly horse in battle. Now, what is striking in this verse is the tense of the verb. This is not future tense. This is not present tense. This is what we call, if we were studying Latin, we'd call it past perfect. It's a completed work. It's in the past. It's done. And the Lord is saying that he has visited his flock, the house of Judah. Now, the house of Judah don't read or understand church. This is talking about the Jewish people. The Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the Jews, say the house of Judah, and made them as a goodly horse in battle. What this says to me is that the antitypical Day of Atonement is a completed act and event. It's a done deal. Now, let me explain antitypical. When we say typical, it is an example of something that is to come. When we say antitypical, we say this is the real. This is not the example. This is the real thing. So what this scripture says to me is that the antitypical Day of Atonement is a completed act and event. In other words, the Day of Atonement, it's not a ceremony that's looking forward anymore. It's a completed act of God. Now notice, incidentally, the apposition. That's two things that are not opposed against each other, but balanced against each other. So notice the apposition of this title, Lord of Hosts. That is the warrior name of God and battle horse of Judah. Okay, this is very, very interesting. We'll get to this a little bit later. Now, for an interesting historical tradition, you have to be very careful with traditions, but uh, we'll look at this one, noting where we think it's right and where we think it's wrong. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that the Jews changed the ceremony that God gave them. The way God set the ceremony up on the Day of Atonement was two goats were selected, lots were cast on them, one was called the goat for Jehovah, and that goat was sacrificed and killed. The other was called the goat for Azazel, and the high priest confessed the sins of the nation, the Jewish nation, on the heads of the goat and sent it out into the wilderness. The Jews changed the ceremony and killed the scapegoat. Not only did they sacrifice the first goat, but they killed the scapegoat too. And the way they did it in the day and time of Jesus was they took the scapegoat up onto the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And some of the walls of the city of Jerusalem uh, are pretty precipitous. And they pushed the goat off the wall and it crashed on the rocks below and died. That is not the way the Lord set the ceremony up. But it's interesting because that actually is what the Jews did. Not only did they do it symbolically, but they did it physically to the Lord. Now, here's the tradition. Fawcett, James, and Brown, three great Christian commentators on the Bible, say that the Jews have a tradition that the fit person, the suitable person, usually a priest who conducted the goat into the wilderness, didn't lead it by a common halter, say a, a, a rope or a strip of leather, but by a piece of scarlet cloth 
tied around its horns. And that in after time, instead of letting the goat loose in the wilderness, it was taken to the summit of a lofty crag a short distance from Jerusalem and hurled down the precipice. And one part of the cloth was allowed to remain on the animal's horns while the other piece of the cloth was spread on the rock. And if at the time of, the, of precipitation, the red color was changed into white, that was recognized as a token that God accepted this. And it's a remarkable circumstance which the Jews believe is the origin of Isaiah's metaphor Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Now, the Talmud tells us that during the 40 years that Simon the Just was high priest, the thread turned white as soon as the goat was thrown over the precipice as a sign that the sins of the people were forgiven. The sins were not forgiven. They were always put off. But this is what the Jews thought when, they, when the cloth changed. But in later times, the change of color was not so invariable, a sign that the people's moral and spiritual deterioration was increasing. And 40 years before the destruction of the second temple in AD 70, no change of color was observed. And I'll take this at face value and say that it was a sign to the Jews that just like Nineveh, they were, their sins were no longer being covered, and the day of a reckoning was at hand, A.D. 70. 55 years, it's a long time, but that's how long world missionary evangelism has been taking care of children. It started with just a few little orphans in India, and it's grown to touch thousands over the last five decades. But what does child sponsorship mean? Well, child sponsorship means that someone just like you is providing food, clothing, medical care, an education, and in many cases, a home in which to live for children who have no one to turn to. Yet through child sponsorship, there's a bridge built, a bridge from nightmares to dreams, an opportunity for those dreams to be realized through education, an opportunity for that child who had no future now to be blessed with a future that lifts others up as you lifted him up. Why don't you pray about and think about sponsoring a child today?